Okay. Uh, <coughs> the uh, en entropy and second law of thermodynamics uh, are introduced for the purpose that we uh, formally describe what happens in nature about processes, that they, which way they can, uh, wh which way the processes can. Uh, follow spontaneously and which way they cannot follow spontaneously. This is what second law of thermodynamics says. And uh, <laughs> well, so how about if we take a look now uh, uh, what uh, <coughs> what kind of processes uh, uh, we uh, we have and actually how nature behaves. Um, if a if a process um, if a process um, undergoes such a uh, such a change that uh, the entropy of the universe does not change, the process is reverse reversible. It means that the, that the process would uh, this type of a process if pro if entropy doesn't change the entropy of the universe doesn't change, then the system could spontaneously come back to the to the uh, initial uh, initial state, the entire universe could go to initial state. Or, um, if I think about, for example, uh, hitting uh, hitting objects uh, by other objects, uh, a reversible process would would be such that uh, heat is transferred <coughs> from one system to another system when there is no temperature difference. Yeah, because think about it, he heat is really a random transfer of, uh, of energy on the microscopic scale. So if, it ra if somehow randomly it goes from one system to another system, well, then it can spontaneously c go back. However, you already, you already probably feel that if temperatures of two systems are equal, heat will not won't be transferred. Uh, actually, we had it as a... Uh, as a uh, in the definition of, of temperature, uh, that when systems are in thermal, because really it is that reversible process in, in case of transferring heat would happen if the two systems are in thermal equilibrium and they transfer heat. They would have to transfer an infinitesimal amount, it can transfer only such an <coughs> amount of heat that none of them would change the temperature. As long as we have differences in temperature, then the uh, um, process is not reversible, and we say actually that it is irreversible. Um, during the thermodynamic process, if, uh, if entropy in, uh, changes, and when entropy changes, it can only change one way. It can only increase. Uh, that process is irreversible. And uh, in nature, all process e processes are irreversible. Uh, now, uh, you have to be aware of which processes. I'm mean, processes on the uh, universal scale, yeah, because if you look, for example, at a, uh, at a particular subsystem of the universe, you can find a process that that system will lower entropy. If you clean your room, <coughs> you will lower the entropy in the room. So the entropy of the room would decrease. <coughs> the thing is that outside <coughs> of the room, you have to have, you have to produce, uh, I mean, you will discard more entropy outside than you took <coughs> out from inside. This is what happens uh, in, a, in an irreversible process. Um, now, you might think, uh, why actually we introduce such a complicated function and as entropy and use entropy to, to phrase uh, uh, second law of thermodynamics? And in fact, actually, in the past, it was, it was not uh, uh, how, first, uh, how second uh, law of thermodynamics was phrased. It was phrased, for example, that way, which seems at the first glance that it's a simpler statement. Uh, now we recognize it as a Clausius uh, <coughs> statement. Uh, previously, we thought about it uh, as an alternative version of uh, second law of thermodynamics. 
And it's, it says that it is impossible to transfer heat from one body to a body at which has higher temperature uh, without other consequences in the universe. So if I bring two systems into a diathermic contact, uh, he, uh, Clausius' statement says that heat will be transferred from a system of higher temperature to system of lower temperature. Uh, well, spontaneously, because uh, obviously we know about systems in which heat actually flows the other way. We use it, right? Can you recall uh, a system uh, from your environment in which heat flows from a system of lower temperature to a system of higher temperature? And actually we are just tuning up appropriate uh, uh, mechanisms to, to do it. What I'm talking about, air conditioning, correct. In air con what an air conditioner does, it takes heat from a hot room, I'm oh, sorry, cold room, and puts it out into cold outside. Heat flows the other way, right? Heat is transferred the other way. Um, <coughs> but there are other consequences. Uh, in order to do this, we have to produce electricity. Uh, and uh, that process produces more entropy um, than uh, moving that heat from, uh, from uh, the uh, um, house to the outside. Now, obviously, if you think about the uh, uh, house, entropy drops, right? Because heat, that, that in order to, if you think about a, a reversible process, I mean, quasi-static process, in which you would have to lower temperature of, uh, of air in the room, it would require that you take away heat, right? So if in the, in the quasi-static process, you see that all the changes in entropy would be, the differential changes in entropy would be negative. So you will add all negative number of negative numbers, and of, of course you are going to get negative number. Uh, now, uh, but uh, the reason actually that we don't use uh, Clausius' statement for uh, as a version of uh, uh, second law of thermodynamics because actually it is more complicated to make other conclusions than from the version which we have. From the version which we have it is easy for example to show that heat will flow spontaneously from system of higher temperature to system of lower temperature. Let's take a look at this. Yeah, so let's say then we have two systems, one has temperature T1, one has temperature T2, and uh, uh, we transfer, uh, and uh, heat is transferred from, differential amount of heat is transferred from one system to another system. So actually, the way we have to do it, because we have to imagine uh, quasi-static processes for each of those subsystems. So think about it that, that uh, you, uh, well, um, uh, um, allow a differential amount of heat to be transferred and then wait until the system uh, establishes uh, its equilibrium. Um, so so it is, you touch for a moment and separate them until the, the temperature uh, uh, establishes itself. Then again you touch them and, and separate them. And that way you transfer uh, heat uh, from one system to another system through a quasi-static uh, process. Well. So in this case, the change in entropy, well, we know that the change in entropy has to be greater than zero, entropy of the universe. Well, since over here only these two systems interact, I mean, I'm assuming that these systems interact and don't interact with anything else, uh, so the change in entropy of the entire system <coughs> is associated with the change in entropy of the, of, of the two systems. Uh, now, if we transfer uh, uh, heat uh, dQ, so the system which gave up heat, <coughs> its entropy will change by a negative value, so it is minus dQ over T1, and the other one will increase by dQ over T2. Now, this expression has to be greater than, uh, <coughs> than zero. Well, think how temperatures have to be related in order 
to, uh, to make it greater than zero. Let's start with the situation that, uh, that they are equal. If the two temperatures are equal, what would be the change in entropy? Exactly zero, right? Because numerators are identical and the denominators are different. All right, so let's now say that T1 is less than T2. Yes, so if T1 is less than T2, if T1 is less than T2, so this is more negative than this one is positive, right? So the change would be <laughs> negative. Uh, well, which, which we can conclude that T1 has to be greater or equal to, uh, sorry, T1 has to be greater or equal to T2 for the process uh, uh, f to follow second law of thermodynamics. Now you have to recognize actually that, that really uh, science describes nature. So, so nature was doing it before we phrased any version of, uh, of uh, second law of thermodynamics. We phrased the, the laws uh, uh, in such a way that they describe nature. So uh, we could not conclude uh, second law of thermodynamics from anything else. It is just a way to remember what nature is doing. Do you understand me? All right. Uh, now, there is, uh, let's take a look at another uh, uh, consequence of uh, second law of thermodynamics, which would be actually quite difficult to derive from a statement that uh, heat flows from system of higher temperature to system of lower temperature. So if we use Clausius' statement as the uh, version of second law of thermodynamics, this conclusion would be not that trivial. However, from the current version of, uh, of uh, uh, the, law, uh, the law, we can conclude it also relatively easily. Now, Planck, Kel uh, Kelvin Planck statement states that it is impossible to construct an engine which will operate in a cycle and would convert all heat into work. Uh, although if we think about uh, a, a process, we can find a process in which heat is completely converted into, uh, into work. Can you remind me what, what kind of, in what kind of process it happens? Yeah, let, take a look at the uh, uh, first law of thermodynamics. It says that the change in internal energy is equal to heat delivered to the system mul uh, 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 minus work done by the system. So if I think about a process, if I imagine a process in which internal energy doesn't change, then I will have that the heat delivered to the system will be equal to the amount of work done by the system. So, th so that thing, th this system would completely convert heat into work, right? Okay, so in what system something like this happens? I mean, what kind of process something like this happens? Think about ideal gas. There is, there is a process in which ideal, in an ideal gas, internal energy of the system does not change. Not adiabatic, in adiabatic process, uh, I mean, there was a suggestion of adiabatic process. It's not correct because in ad adiabatic process, actually, uh, heat delivered to the system is uh, uh, zero. So let's see what happens in adiabatic process because in adiabatic process is work done in adiabatic process does the gas perform uh, work in adiabatic process who thinks yes in adiabatic process there is no heat de no heat delivered is uh, work done in adiabatic process is uh, work being done well, you have to think, in if in adiabatic process, the volume changes. Does the volume change in adiabatic process? Yes. Who's, does it? It does. it does. Volume changes, which means that work is, work is performed. Correct. In adiabatic process, work is performed. 
Heat is not delivered to the gas, but work is performed. How is it possible? So, 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 uh, we are getting work from nothing. Aha, uh -huh, correct. Yeah, we are getting that the energy from the system. Internal energy of the system has to decrease, right? So the system decreases its internal energy and work is being done. Uh, all right. <coughs> Uh, but uh, which means actually that this is the wrong, the wrong process. My question is to find a process in which heat is converted into work. And in, in adiabatic process, only work, uh, only internal energy is converted into, uh, into work. Uh, so, so think about another process. Iso let's think about isochoric. Isothermal. I want to think about isochoric. In isochoric process, uh, do we convert heat into work? Not at all, correct? Because in isochoric process, volume doesn't change. There is no work done. All the heat is actually uh, converted into internal, internal energy. Um, all right, there was a suggestion of an isothermal process. Let's think about isothermal process. Is heat converted completely into uh, work? Yes. This time it's yes, because if uh, in isothermal uh, process, at least for an ideal gas, when the temperature does not change, it means that internal energy of the gas doesn't change either, which means that a heat delivered is equal to the gas is equal to the work done by the gas. All right, I think, uh, isn't it in uh, contradiction with, the, with our statement, with the uh, Kelvin-Planck statement? Uh, consult with each other and find why it is not? Because obviously it is not. If uh, uh, we, ha we have this uh, statement in the book, we, and, uh, which means that most likely uh, this is true. That, that so far it describes properly the, uh, the, uh, the nature. And I think, actually, you over here, I heard, heard the right answer. What's, what uh, is? Because we haven't considered the cycle. Right. We, in isothermal process, is not a <coughs> cyclical process. We have to come back to the original, I mean, the, the, en the engine would have to come back to the, or the machine uh, would have to, uh, to come back to the original state. And if if it expands only isothermally, well, it will never get back, uh, compressed uh, back. All right, uh, let's imagine, so, so let's see. How about if we, if we start with the uh, proof by contradiction? So uh, let's try to imagine a system that really works in such a way that it converts heat into work. Yeah, so it takes heat from a source and performs work and nothing will no, 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 uh, and, and it will go through a cycle engine will go through a cycle taking heat and converting it to work well so let's see by how much uh, the uh, entropy of the universe will change now let's think what is changing uh, uh, entropy let's start with this one with the source of the heat. Does the source of the heat change its entropy? And, and I hear uh, answer yes, and it's correct. It is changing, it is changing entropy because, well, it is changing its state by giving up heat. All right, now if I consider 
a cycle. So if a system goes through a cycle, will the uh, entropy of the working system change? I hear no, and can I, uh, can, I, uh, can I hear an argument? Why not? Why the entropy of the engine? This is correct answer. Uh, do, you have, do you have an answer? Why? Because if it is cyclical, it means that it has to return to its original state, which means that the, all variables have to come back to its original state, which means that entropy has to return to its original state. So entropy of the engine, uh, uh, entropy of the engine has to return to its original state. Well, nothing else actually was changing state over here. The surrounding was not involved in that process. So, so the rest of the universe does not change entropy at all. Only these two systems have to be considered and on top of it, this one, this one uh, does not change uh, um, entropy. And the change in entropy of the source of the heat is going to be negative. It is supposed to give up heat. All right. So here we have zero. This number is negative. Temperature of the source is positive. So we are getting the, the, the change in entropy of the universe in such a situation would be zero, uh, less, than, less than zero N or negative, which means that the process cannot take place. Uh, well, how come that we have engines? Well, we have engines, but not all of the heat is converted into work. We have to have another <coughs> system which will take away some heat. Because now let's take a look what's happening. This time, uh, change in entropy of the universe will additionally have change in entropy of the sink. And so now I have the same term as before, which is negative term, plus I have another term, which is positive. Entropy of the sink is going to increase. Uh, now, think about the temperatures. What, what the, this, uh, I put subscript C for this temperature because this, the temperature of the sink must be lower than the temperature of the, uh, of the uh, source, of the heat source. Uh, so that this, uh, who are, I mean, because when we, when we think how much work is done, uh, how much work will be done actually if, uh, uh, in a, if the engine goes through a cycle, it absorbs this amount of heat from the source and discards this amount of heat by the, uh, to the sink. How much work? And uh, the answer is the difference between the two and the reason. How did you figure it out that, that, that it is going to be difference between the two heats? Because the conclusion is right, and we have a, an important statement from which the conclusion was made. Yeah, because right now I think you, you have just a feeling about, uh, I don't want even to say. Yeah, you, you just have kind of intuition about it, which is based on your experience, and, the, and you make conclusions from uh, previous statements. And actually I can think about two statements. Uh, uh, which, uh, well, uh, from which w one can conclude that the amount of work performed by the engine is equal to the difference in the heat. What are those two statements? The engine is cyclical, the remainder of the heat has to go somewhere. Right, so uh, why it, ha yeah, because <coughs> we had here a suggestion that uh, somewhere that difference has to go, and I, I, my question is why? Why that difference has to go somewhere? What physical law says that that 
that that difference has to go go somewhere. Uh, no, name 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 the law. And and you can recall two laws. One law was actually not uh, not. Uh, uh, phrase specifically for for heat uh, or for thermodynamics. It was it was a law which which we discussed long long time ago, um, uh, and uh, at that time I just said that it is more general than just for this particular situation. Uh, but now we can use this as an argument, and then there is another law which uh, we discussed very recently, this week. First law of thermodynamics, correct. In a cycle, the internal energy of the system, of the engine, does not change. Now, it means that heat delivered to the system is equal to this work. Now, heat delivered is amount of heat which was delivered from hot, uh, uh, from the source, minus heat which was taken away. Yes, so we have two heats now in the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the equation, and one work in the equation. And change in internal energy is zero. All right, correct. So from the first law of thermodynamics, we could figure it out that the difference is equal to the work. And uh, <coughs> what was the other law? Which actually, uh, uh, first law of thermodynamics is, is just rephrasing that other law. Not work energy theorem. It's more than that. I mean, a special case of work energy theorem. It's true. It is a consequence of work energy theorem. But what I had in mind was the law of energy conservation. Yeah. Energy is not created or destroyed. Right? So if this much energy was delivered, this much energy was taken away, the energy of this one didn't change, which means that we have to take out energy somewhere in, in, some di in a different way. And the different way is by performing, uh, by performing work. Um, all right, so we see that we, with, when we have heat sink, indeed we can satisfy uh, this condition provided that the sink has lower temperature than the, uh, than the uh, uh, source of heat. And actually, depending on this, I mean, think about <coughs> how much work will be done if, if the difference in temperature is small. Let's say one one Kelvin. If the, if the difference is one Kelvin, can we and uh, or compare actually how much work engine can done when the difference is one Kelvin and and let's say ten Kelvin, hundred and hundred Kelvin. Yeah, because we always have to satisfy the condition that the entropy has to increase. Yeah, so if, if, the if the two temperatures are close to each other, well, what means that we have to, uh, well, uh, then, then we have to put a lot of heat into the sink. Do you see that? In order to make it positive. Which means that we can have very little work done. Now, think about it if this temperature is very low. Think about that it is close to zero then we need very little heat to get this term, I mean, the uh, heat discarded in the sink in order to get this term huge. Do you see that? So if we discard very little heat, it means that a lot of work, a lot of that heat which was taken away from the source is converted into, into work. Uh, I have already used efficiency, uh, symbol for efficiency. Now, formally, efficiency is defined as the amount of work which we obtain. In other words, the energy which we, which we found useful 
divided by the energy which is which we had to use in order to uh, to get that much uh, useful energy. This is uh, f this coefficient is called uh, um, efficiency, and indeed now I wrote we can recognize that the difference in uh, heat delivered from the source and uh, discarded in the sink is equal to the amount of, uh, of work. Uh, I'm not going uh, to derive it further, but uh, uh, I can, oh, well, I can simplify it that way and relate it then to, to temperatures. Um, actually, this expression is uh, has to be smaller than if we uh, ran this r r if the engine was working in a Carnot cycle with these two temperatures. Uh, <coughs> All right. So think about our body. Is our body an e an efficient engine? And actually. Do you, see, uh, do you see the effect of dumping heat uh, when you think about our body? Because our body is an engine. And it is engine even working on a cyclical, uh, in a cyclical way. We, we, we keep our state. Right. Now, can we perform work? Yes, quite easily, right? I mean, we even go, go to gym to perform work to burn heat and <coughs> what have you noticed how do you burn it do you convert all your food into work no now when you go to work out what other effect do you see you sweat a lot why You're you are getting off heat you have to you have to give up this this heat to the sink we are an engine which is a real engine and therefore it has to it has to follow second law of thermodynamics as well all right let's now take a look at this how a refrigerator works yeah because refrigerator now moves uh, uh, heat from lower temperature to higher to higher temperature i'm not sure if i have the notes uh, <coughs> So a refrigerator is a device, and actually we have more than the, the, the refrigerators. Air conditioning uh, is a heat pump. Um, no, sorry, air conditioning is not a heat pump. But we also use devices which is called a heat pump to warm up, for example, households by taking, uh, in winter, taking heat from outside and bringing it inside. Uh, <coughs> And it is a smart, actually, approach to heating up uh, houses. It is much better than using an electrical heater. Uh, and we'll see why. Uh, now, uh, in case of, of refrigerators, well, uh, it's kind of a coefficient. It's called coefficient of performance. Uh, but uh, it's also a kind of efficiency of a refrigerator. Well, in a refrigerator, uh, the purpose is to get rid of, of heat. So uh, heat taken away from that cold system uh, divided by the amount of energy o uh, which we have to put in uh, describes how good is that, re uh, that refrigerator. Now let's see how a refrigerator works. Um, now this uh, coefficient of uh, performance also cannot exceed the most uh, efficient refrigerator and the most ref uh, efficient refrigerator would all uh, would work on a reverse Carnot cycle and well so what it does now is that it takes heat from the cold refrigerator uh, takes heat from the cold system and dumps it in the hot system. Now, in order actually to do this, it has to take energy. Uh, energy uh, well, one would have to. The, the, uh, this would have to perform negative work 
In other words, something would have to work now on that pump. It isn't, it is not an engine anymore. We would have to perform work over here. So looking at that, I will give you a puzzle now. Uh, well, if, it, if I think about the refrigerator in the kitchen, so what is where? Uh, what is what is this uh, system in the refrigerator, considering refrigerator in the kitchen? It's what? This is the inside of the refrigerator. What's that? This is what? This is the kitchen. Uh, what's that? This is the electrical outlet. Correct. Yes, yeah, so we can think about power plant. All right. Now, I want you to, to again recall the uh, first law of thermodynamics and think about the process. I mean, I would, I, I would like to, to use a refrigerator to cool off the, uh, the kitchen. And I think that I have had this ingenious uh, way of doing it. I will open the door. I will open the door to the, uh, in the refrigerator with, a, with an assumption that this is going to cool off the kitchen. Is it? Uh, who thinks that it would uh, lower the temperature in the kitchen if I kept the uh, refrigerator open? Who thinks that the temperature would not change? Who thinks that the temperature will go up? Oh, some people, like, so who thinks that the temperature will not change? Uh -huh. Very good, actually. All right. Well, can you, give, can you maybe give us an argument? Why, do you, why did you change your mind? Why did you think that the temperature would go up? Right, because the first thing, uh, the first thought was that whatever was taken out from refrigerator, from the, uh, I mean, through the inside, has to go on the outside. And actually, take a look, if you haven't done it yet, turn around the refrigerator and see what you have over there and touch that, that, that part over there. You'll recognize that it's hot because the refrigerator gives up heat on that other side. So, one would, so, so with the first approach, you would probably think is that whatever was taken out from, through the inside went from the outside. So really, heat was traveling around in that, uh, in that refrigerator. But now you recognize properly, or Justin, rec rec I mean, those of you who thought that, that the temperature will go up, and I saw that most of you got convinced to that, you recognize that there was energy also delivered from the electrical outlet. That electrical outlet had to perform work. So the heat expelled at the back of the refrigerator is greater than the one which is taken from the, uh, through the inside. So ref you could use refrigerator to warm up the kitchen. This is the only thing which you can do. Um, how about now if we take a look at, the, at this, how a geothermal pump works. Uh, well, it's a heat pump. And the purpose of heat pump, and actually if you, uh, if you have a house and install the uh, heat pump, I think you, you will get a tax uh, uh, break for, uh, for that uh, because it will save energy. Uh, <coughs> well, it will save the, the energy. Uh, actually, maybe I will come back for a moment to, to the refrigerator because it operates exactly the same way as, as, uh, as a refrigerator. It takes electricity, it grabs heat from outside, and warms up the room. Why is it more efficient than using just an electrical heater? I uh, well, why don't, why don't you? Uh, because I mean, uh, I think I understand you, and uh, why don't you say it loud so that everybody can hear it, and uh, we will have a discussion on that. Well, with the electrical heater, it's having to generate all the heat from scratch. It's having to create it from the work that's being put in. It 
physics at this point is available in the system. And what do you mean by system? Um, from, from the surrounding system. Uh, from the, right, from the surrounding system. Correct. Uh, yes, I, I think that now everybody under, uh, should understand it. Have you? I mean, just let me revi uh, revise it. If we, have, if we have just an electrical heater, it takes electricity and converts into heat. So the amount uh, of heat delivered to the room is equal to the amount of consumed electricity, right? Now what heat pump does, we, it takes electricity to grab some heat from outside. And the amount of heat released, therefore, according to the first law of thermodynamics, is going to be equal to the sum of the electricity which was used plus the heat it grabbed from outside. And actually heat pump can take three times more energy from the outside than from the power plant. So, so we will use four times less energy to, to get the same effect. Uh, all right. Now, in order to make this machine, this is a trick how to make this machine. And uh, really, the heart of the pump is this, this uh, uh, fragment over here. We have a, a compressor over here. Oh, how about... Let's mark, mark all of them. Uh, we have a compressor over here, which, uh, and on the other side of a compressor, we have a, 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 a we call it an expansion valve, and really this, the, the purpose of this valve is to make sure that it is possible to compress uh, working uh, uh, liquid on this side, and that it could be, uh, we could lower pressure on this side. So, so really, the valve together with compressor, you can think about it just like a, like a loop with a pump. Or, or a, 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 a pump which, which, which has this loop. If we didn't have a valve, it will just make that fluid uh, run uh, uh, in a circle, right? Now, with this valve, it, uh, it, it, it is an obstacle for that fluid. So we can compress that fluid on this side and... Uh, make it at lower pressure on the other side. Can you imagine? Are you following me? All right. Now, so what it does now, and at lower pressure, this, uh, f the fluid over here, well, it enters, it, it is in a liquid form and it evaporates. When we lower pressure, we, we uh, stimulate evaporation. Evaporation requires heat to be delivered, right? It requires latent heat. Uh, so if, if there was no source of heat, it would simply cool off. Yet it would be something like if you rub alcohol on your hand and, and blow on that, you will feel that, that, that evaporating alcohol will uh, cause uh, cooling. Uh, you, you will feel a cooling effect of that alcohol when it evaporates. Well, actually, this is why we sweat, too. We sweat and w water evaporates and it cools, cools us off. Uh, so that system over here cools off. Well, if it, it, if, we, if it evaporates at the appropriate rate, it will cool off to such a value that it will easily grab heat from, from a liquid which flows. I mean, this, this liquid is, let's say, f uh, 40 Fahrenheit we can cool it off to a temperature of 30 Fahrenheit by evaporation. So it will be grabbing heat from, uh, from that system. And that system over here, I mean, this is a geothermal pump, so we'll have to dig, uh, to put a hole under the ground. It, it will simply take heat from the ground. Uh, all right, now when it goes through the uh, through the pump, it is being compressed. That, that vapor is being compressed. Well, when it is being compressed here, I, well, first of all, when it is compressed, it already increases temperature. Now, when it is squeezed, it will condense on this side. When it condenses, 
its temperature goes up, uh, or it has to give up, uh, give up heat. Well, therefore, that liquid in the, uh, in the radiator now will be cooler than the, than the uh, liquid in the compressor and will take away. Uh, so let's say that in the compressor, the temperature will go to 100 Fahrenheit or 120 Fahrenheit, which will uh, warm up the uh, liquid in, the, in this loop. And therefore, it will increase the temperature in the room. So this is how a heat pump works. Well, notice that uh, heat was transferred from lower temperature to higher temperature. However, work had to be done in the compressor. Uh, all right. So this will be all for today. Thank you very much. Now.